This is Justin Brown from Medium Popcorn Podcast. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time you know, to sit down with me today and also for making this uh, documentary uh, because when it really comes down to it, I feel like there's not a lot of places for uh, black people to feel kind of in a safe space and kind of enjoy themselves and just having a documentary about one of those safe spaces that actually survived out there is super important. Uh, but in the documentary, uh, Freaknik was referenced uh, as uh, the black stuck. Now, obviously, there's been other, um, you know, black events, you know, that ha happened, you know, in the past. What do you feel like really set Freaknik apart from those other events? Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's probably the biggest black festival um, before the Rolling Louds and all of that stuff of today. And it happened organically. It wasn't something that was sort of planned. I mean, it started as a really small picnic from some students from the HBCU and the AUC in Atlanta it became a global phenomenon, you know, went from like 50 people to three, 400,000 people. So I think that that, you know, today everything's produced and sort of organized and there's all this social media. I mean, that was a thing that spread by word of mouth, literally um, it became a cultural phenomenon. You know, it is interesting because, um, you know, watching uh, this, it made me think about the growth of just Facebook, you know, you know, in its entirety, because when it start Facebook started, it was just schools. And then mm -hmm. it branched out to everyone else. And so it is truly just a testament to what was created, you know, by the founders, you know, uh, starting as what, 1983, with just, you know, 50 people and expanding to what it was. It's it's actually something to be heralded. Uh, but so in also the documentary, there's a mention about the rim shot. <clears throat> is there any plans uh, to do a documentary on just the a rim shot, the rim shot being that is it, it was a spot uh, uh, a meeting place for black entertainment and, uh, you know, just black Hollywood. Might be our next, our next job. <laughs> uh, I, I, I got to tell Eric <laughs> about that. I mean, but that rim shop was a real wild place. I mean, it, it just became people slept there. You know, Jalen Rose talked about that. People, Tupac was there. It was a place that, you know, unfortunately they didn't really sell many rims because they were doing other things. You know, there's some pretty <laughs> funny stories about people seeing their actual cars being driven around Atlanta. You know, it's a place you can see Bobby Brown to, you know what I mean, to the biggest athlete. So I'm um, glad that you enjoyed that story about the rim shop back in the day. Yeah, it, it, it just really jumped out off the screen. We really could. I was like, I want to know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously uh, saying that, you know, about the diversity, black spaces, uh, but in your, you know, being there, the people have been there. How diverse was Freak Nick? Or was it strictly just black people? Because in the videos, I don't think I saw one <laughs> white face in there, um, which is it, it, it's it's not it's very seldom to have that. But, you know, in, it, it, could you even think about even uh, noticing any other, you know, people there attending? I definitely saw one white face when we were reviewing the footage. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it made the cut, but it's in there. <laughs> but no, I mean, that was, you know, it, the Atlanta's the chocolate city of the South. Yeah. And again, I think this people realize it's a student. Um, this, this was started by students, young black students from the AUC. And I don't think it was a case where they weren't having other races there. But, you know, you got Daytona. You got a lot of other places where white college students, mm -hmm. you know, go and turn up. And so I think this was a um, this was like a for us, by us picnic because a lot of times we're excluded from those things. And so just in typical hip hop fashion, we created our own. Love it. Love it. All right. And um, so uh, in the doc, we also st uh, uh, spoke about, you know, kind of the black music scene at the, actually the Southern music uh, scene of hip hop at the time. Uh, can you speak to how much uh, Freaknik helped expand uh, Southern music? Because, you know, the airways were being dominated by New York and uh, and L.A. at the time. And like, what did this mean for those Southern artists? 
Yeah, I mean, there was so much talent bubbling in Atlanta that was unrecognized. And so Freaknik really allowed for people to come from these different places around the country and take that music and that culture back with them. So much was birthed out of that, including outcasts like we talk about in the film. Yeah, no, I mean, you can you can directly chart, as I mentioned before, the rise of So So Deaf mm -hmm. um, in the 90s, you know, literally 92, 93. You see that happen. You see LaFace with TLC. You know, I mean, Bobby Brown was there at the time. Luke, who came from Florida, but became the king of Freak Nick. So Southern hip hop. And I think people forget all of those kids. And when it, the thing that made Freak Nick so big was in the South, you could just drive there. So you got Alabama, mm -hmm. Georgia's. Texas, Arkansas, all of those kids were coming there and they're taking the music and spreading it back out. You know, back then we had a thing called uh, like a, a mixtape, a sampler. Are you familiar yeah. with these things? Yes, yeah, very, very much so. Have you heard of a cassette tape before? <laughs> okay, no. I'm not that yeah. young. I'm not that oh, young. You're not that young. <laughs> and so you would pass the cassette tape around and, you know, if somebody liked your music, they could immediately put it in and start listening to it. So that was, I think the pass around ability made the music situation explode because you had all these people who were never around each other before. And now they're starting to listen to the same music. And by the way, I think, you know, we've said it before, but Freaknik is a music documentary. I know it's about culture, yeah. but the base of it, excuse me, is about the music um, that dominated the South back then. Nice. Uh, so you know, the name Freaknik, it's almost it almost feels like it was tailor made for Uncle Luke <laughs> 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 to come in and, and do his thing. Um, how, yeah, can you just speak to the fact is like where he um, like how much of a big impact obviously he did have a great impact or like uh, but what was his impact on just, you know, Freaknik as a whole and kind of it kind of changed kind of the complexity of it, especially after doing the video down there. Mm -hmm. You can talk about the music. No, I, th I think it just, uh, you know, Luke put the freak in Freaknik. <laughs> he told yeah. us, you know, if there was some freaky going on, he had it to be there. But I think Luke and the bass music, you know, if you look at a lot of those videos from Freaknik, it's people dancing, jumping on their cars, having a good time. And Luke's music is made to dance. I mean, I, I don't want to put your business out there, but I'm sure you got an auntie that when Doodoo -Doo Brown comes <laughs> on, she don't, you know, have her Bible out. She might be doing other things. So, you know, Freaknik <laughs> and Luke is a, such a big part of our culture. And it was really the soundtrack of Freaknik, you know, good, you got to have some good bass music. You know, we put my boo in there, which is one of my favorite songs. And I think it really complimented the film. And I think it really, it gave, especially women, um, some women in the film that express, it made them feel free and it made them feel like they can dance and, and sort of just enjoy that moment without any judgment. So Luke's, Luke's music really brought that out in, you know, at Freaknik, but also in people at that time and still to this day. All right. So my last question is, uh, so obviously, as stated in the document um, documentary, uh, the Olympics was kind of the, the catalyst for the end of uh, Freaknik. It, it, you know, uh, if the Olympics didn't happen, what do you foresee what, you know, the Freaknik uh, could have done, where it would have gone and, and, and how significant it may could still be today? Well, that's a really good question i mean i think uh i don't think the olympics was the only thing i think some of the well, violence of course and some yeah. of the situations assaults on young people and young ladies especially mm -hmm. um was the round downfall and i think you know a lot of people unfortunately who weren't college students who weren't sort of people who were peaceful started to come to it and you know it got a little bit dark and so i think that even without the olympics some of the crowd had changed from the early 90s and late 80s and so it became a little bit more dangerous and so i think the combination of the olympics which of course the city no disrespect obviously didn't want that nuisance to traffic all of the people in the street because they were going to be seen globally with the olympics so i think unfortunately the city of atlanta had to kind of get it out of there because they didn't want that face but um yeah i think it was just more of the olympics though yeah and i think it, it lacked a little bit of organization if there was really an organization or people that um, intentionally plan Freaknik and work with the city to create plans, then it was something that could potentially last longer. But the way that it happened so organically and people just coming, there was no one place in Atlanta that was Freaknik. Freaknik was all over the city. And so it was hard yeah. to contain and therefore a little hard to organize too. Yep. All right, guys, that's my time. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. And uh, again, would love to see uh, a documentary about the rim shop. <laughs> we're, we're waiting for that. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you Justin. so much. Peace. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right.